Next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I remind the Chamber that my wife is a serving officer with Police Scotland. Uh, my colleague, Murdo Fraser, was the subject of a spurious complaint about a social media post which was critical of the SNP government. He discovered that Police Scotland had recorded the complaint against him as a non-crime hate incident. No crime was committed, but he is now on the police record as a perceived offender in a supposed hate incident, despite never being charged, tried, convicted, or even informed the police had a file on him. Hamza Youssef, how can it be right that innocent people are put on the police record when they have done nothing wrong? First Minister. Presiding officer, um, let me uh, try to provide some context on the issue that Douglas Ross raises. I think it is important that when we're talking about uh, hate, hatred, the hate, cr uh, hate crime, or indeed the Hate Crime Public uh, Order Act, that we do so uh, in a way that is not just considered, but also ensures that we stick uh, to the facts. So let me try to provide some context on the issue that Douglas Ross uh, references. Firstly, let us remember that the recording of non-crime hate incidents has come as a direct result of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. It was contained within recommendations, 12 to 17, of the McPherson report. So they have been around, the recording of non-crime hate incidents, for many, many years. Secondly, as well as being around for many years, non-crime hate incidents are, are recorded, uh, sorry, non-crime incidents are recorded for incident, other incidents uh, as well that don't meet a criminal threshold, such as, for example, for domestic abuse incidents. And I don't know if Douglas Ross uh, is suggesting or not that he doesn't think that domestic abuse incidents shouldn't be recorded if they don't meet a criminal uh, threshold or whether it's just in relation to hate crime or not. Uh, thirdly, let me be clear that, that, of course, the Hate Crime Act is not yet in force, so there's nothing within the Hate Crime Act that changes how hate crime or, indeed, a hate, non, uh, hate, uh, sorry, non crime hate incident is recorded. Uh, let me, uh, if I can, uh, make that point by quoting uh, Professor James Chalmers, who is well known uh, to this chamber. He says, and I quote, such recording in terms of non-crime hate incidents is a long-standing feature of police practice. Communicating clearly just how little the act changes is essential to avoid undue fears about its impact and any attempts to abuse it. Uh, lastly, presiding officer, because I know uh, this is a substantial issue, uh, that notwithstanding this, Police Scotland have made it clear last year, uh, and, and again they've made it clear uh, because of recent uh, press inquiries, that they will be reviewing how non-crime hate incidents are recorded cognizant of the changes that have been made in England and Wales. So I go back to the central point that I started with, presiding officer, that there is uh, far too much hatred. We all accept that in our society. We all should come together in order to help to tackle it. And I would urge the Conservatives in particular, notwithstanding legitimate questions that Douglas Ross, Ross asks, to come together in that effort to support the Act and support a zero-tolerance approach to hatred in our society. Douglas Ross. But we all have a zero-tolerance approach. We all have a zero-tolerance approach to hatred in society. But my question, which the First Minister took over two minutes to try and answer, was should innocent people have a police record when they have done nothing wrong? And it sounds from that answer, from Hamza Youssef, that he believes they should. And he's previously said this is uh, about monitoring, about gathering data. But what will the value of that data be if we can now see that individuals can put forward multiple complaints with little or no substance in them, and that data will then be stored and recorded in the way it has with Murdo Fraser? Uh, and this unacceptable incident is just the tip of the iceberg. The SNP's Hate Crime Act will come into force in just a few days' time and could lead to more cases just like this. The controversial new law is ripe for abuse. In a letter to this Parliament's Criminal Justice Committee, the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents said that some individuals will, and I quote, will seek to weaponise the new legislation and associated police investigation. Does Hamza Youssef agree with some of the most senior police officers in Scotland? And does he accept that this law could be weaponised? First Minister. Officer, Douglas Ross says that we all have a zero tolerance approach to hate crime. I'm not entirely convinced 
uh, that when you take money from a racist misogynist and then refuse to give it back, that is a zero tolerance approach <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, 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 in relation to the issue of non-crime hate incidents uh, and the impact and the effect they have and what is the purpose of them, I, I refer Douglas Ross to the Chief Constable, who is very clear at the Scottish Police Authority board meeting just last week, the value of the recording of hate incidents. Uh, and she said, and I quote directly, on recording reporting hate incidents, they can and do give us a sense initially of community tensions. So they are useful to us in terms of engaging with communities, engaging with different groups and communities, and being able to understand where there is potential for tensions to be raised, at the end, end of quote. So I would say that there is uh, an understanding of the reasons and rationale why uh, hate incidents uh, are recorded. That is precisely why the McPherson report uh, recommended them in the first place around about 25 uh, years ago, presiding officer. And let me say, in terms of the Hate Crime uh, Act itself, uh, of course we take seriously what is said by, uh, by the Scottish Police Federation, uh, ASPs or any other uh, representative organisation representing uh, police officers. But I think it is incumbent on me to say that this act, of course, the new offences in relation to stirring up, are hugely uh, important. Those, those stirring up offences for racial hatred have existed since 1986. We are simply extending those protections to other marginalised groups. I think it is important for Douglas Ross, to be honest, to tell, people, uh, to tell people in this chamber and also the people of Scotland, who is it that he thinks is not deserving of those protections yeah. in the same way that I have been protected because of my race since 1986? Yeah. Yeah. Douglas Ross. The problem is, First Minister, people will not be protected if the police cannot do their job. We have warnings week after week from officers on the front line, from the Police Federation, and now from the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents. Their line at the top of their letterhead says, representing the operational leaders of the police service in Scotland. They are giving as stark a warning as possible to this SNP government that the bill is flawed. It is not going to do what MSPs who supported it wanted it to do. And those warnings are being ignored by Hamza Youssef. But let's see if he will also ignore others on this. Uh, Katharina Casper is the chair of the Scottish Police Authority's Complaints and Conduct Committee. She said an investigation itself can become a punishment which may have a chilling effect on the freedom of expression. And Hamza Youssef has directed his comments today uh, at me as Conservative leader and the Conservative Party. What does he say to one of his most senior SNP MPs, Joanna Cherry KC? She said this, and I quote, For many, the process will be the punishment. Being under police investigation will be stressful, costly, damaging to reputations, and could lead to problems in the workplace. Presiding officer, the police should not be dispatched to people's doors to check their thinking. Doesn't the First Minister recognise the chilling effect, chilling effect his law will have on free speech? First Minister. Second officer, uh, these issues were rehearsed last week, but to emphasise and reiterate to Douglas Ross that there are, of course, protections of freedom, for freedom of expression, freedom of speech explicitly within the bill. In fact, there is a, a, a triple lock protection because there is explicit reference in the bill itself in relation to freedom of expression. And they were a matter of compromise between the government and members of the opposition. I think they were a good example of how we do uh, legislation here in this parliament. Of course, there is a reasonable person uh, defence within the legislation itself. And of course, our legislation has to comply with the European Convention of Human Rights and the important articles within that in relation to freedom of expression. Uh, secondly, presiding officer, I have absolute faith in police's ability to weed out uh, vexatious complaints. They unfortunately have to deal with vexatious complaints across a whole range of legal matters uh, and complaints that are made right across the legal uh, landscape. I have absolute faith in the ability to address those issues in ways that are appropriate. And let me go back to the central point here that stirring up offences are not new. They have existed since 1986 for most of my entire life. And therefore, I've got absolute confidence in Police Scotland's ability to be able to police new stirring up offences in the ways that are appropriate. And let me say again to Douglas Ross that his party, the Conservatives, did support stirring up offences when they were brought, uh, when those offences were extended in England and Wales in Westminster. So if they're OK uh, in order to protect people in England and Wales, why are they not OK to protect people 
here in Scotland. Yeah. And I go, again, I yeah. say to Douglas Ross, if he believes in a zero tolerance approach, if he believes that somebody who's Jewish or elderly or gay or disabled should be protected from behaviour that's threatening or abusive and intended to stir up hatred, then why is he opposing this legislation? Because from my view, it certainly looks like just for the sake of opposition presenting officer. <laughs> Before we move to Mr Ross's um, next question, of course, there are many members who would like the opportunity to put questions to the First Minister today, and therefore I'd be grateful if we could have more concise questions and responses. Douglas Ross. Hamza Youssef can see absolutely no flaw in his legislation that he took through this Parliament, despite the overwhelming evidence we are getting from frontline officers uh, and many others. The Hate Crime Act will come into force on April Fool's Day, but it is no joke. The Scottish Conservatives opposed it at the time and still do. It is so flawed that whatever its intentions, it is likely to create more division. Overworked, under-resourced police officers will be forced to deal with hundreds of malicious complaints. Hamza Yusuf's law could be weaponised against people with opposing views. Police investigations will tarnish the names of innocent people and could silence them. This law is overreach by the SNP. So how long will it take before the Hate Crime Act goes the same way as named persons, offensive behaviour at football, gender recognition reform and every other flawed SNP law? First Minister. Thank you, officer. The Hate Crime Act uh, is one that not just I am proud of, but this entire parliament should be proud of. And of course, every single political party came together to support that act, except the Scottish Conservatives. And why should they be proud of it? They should be proud of it because it was supported by a number of groups that represent some of the most marginalised in our communities. Uh, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities stated, and again I'll quote, that they support the bill, strongly support the introduction of this new offence, that's a stirring up offence, and its application across all protected characteristics. Why is it important? Well, it's important because Lord Brackadale, who led the independent review, which then of course helped us to develop uh, the Hate Crime uh, Act said uh, that stirring up of hatred may lead to violence or public disorder. It may incite people to commit offences such as assault. He called it conduct that is morally wrong. Uh, and I think he is absolutely right to do that. So we have freedom of expression uh, clauses within the bill that protect people's right to freedom of expression. But what we do with this Hate Crime Act is we ensure that Scotland does send a message, this Parliament sends a message, this country sends a message to those who are often the targets of hatred that we truly have a zero tolerance approach. So letting off to that something I'm very proud of indeed. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, our country faces serious challenges that demand serious leadership. But in the past year, we have had a government led by Hamza Youssef with no vision, no strategy and no plan. Not my words, but the words of many in his own party and leading figures across the country. On the two biggest issues facing our country, Audit Scotland has said the First Minister's government has no vision for the NHS and is lacking political leadership on the economy. In the midst of a housing crisis, Shelter Scotland has said the First Minister has no credibility. And as our country grapples with the climate crisis, the Climate Change Committee says the government has no comprehensive strategy and no credible plan. So does he agree with the verdict of the experts that this is a government with no strategy, no vision and no plan? First Minister. I tend to believe in the verdict of the Scottish people who time and time again have trusted the SNP to be the government uh, of uh, Scotland and have rejected Anna Sarwar and his Labour Party time and time and time again. And Anna Sawar, who is famed for his hubris, is already putting up the bunting, is already telling people of Scotland that their votes have been taken for granted, whereas that this Scottish Government, this party that I lead, will never, ever take the people of Scotland for granted in any election whatsoever. And let me say to Anna Sawar on some of the issues... Let's hear the he First Minister. They don't want to hear the record of this Government. Let me tell them the record, presiding officer of this Government. When it comes to the NHS, of course, we have record investment of over £19.5 billion pounds in this health service. We have statistics this week showing that we have record numbers of junior doctors joining the NHS, presiding officer. Record levels of staffing under this government in the NHS. And, of course, presiding officer, we are making improvements. We're helping our NHS through recovery. How? By investing in our, our NHS staff to the point 
where they are the best paid staff Let us anywhere hear the first in the minister. UK. And of course, what is markedly different in Scotland and compared to Conservative run England or indeed Labour run Wales, is in Scotland we haven't lost a single day of NHS activity to strike action. Anna Sarwar. Bring also uh, record levels of denial and bluster from the First Minister right there. No vision, no strategy, and no plan failing on the basics of government. And this incompetence has consequences. In health, NHS waiting lists have gone up in the past year, with tens of thousands of more people added. On the economy, a complete failure to deliver growth, and businesses struggling and cancelling investment. In justice, green lighting plans to let crimes go uninvestigated and police stations closing across the country. In education, standards falling, violence rising, and teacher numbers being cut. And in housing, a cut of £190 million when tonight nearly 10,000 children will go to sleep without a home to call their own. First Minister, this is your record after just the, a year in the job. How can Scotland afford another two years of this? First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, my record in the last year has seen, of course, an will see an estimated 100,000 children lifted out of poverty here in Scotland. That record, of course, has seen a record number of junior doctors joining the NHS in Scotland. That record sees the best paid NHS staff anywhere in the UK. It sees not a single day of NHS activity lost to strike action, which is very different this week, where in Labour-run Wales, where junior doctors have once again been forced to go on strike, presiding officer. And in terms of the key economic indicators under this government, GDP per head has increased at a greater rate in Scotland than it has in the UK. Productivity has increased at a greater rate per head in comparison to the rest of the UK. And just last month, Statistics, of course, showing that we have greater private sector employment growth, better than any other nation or region of the UK. And what is Anna Sarwar's record? The only consistency over the last year, presiding officer, is that he is completely inconsistent, U-turned, dumped every single principle or policy, and fallen into line behind Keir Starmer, presiding officer. Anna Sarwar. <laughs> Even they're feeling sorry for him, for, uh, presiding officer. <laughs> the first minister doesn't seem to want to. The first minister, the first minister Let's hear doesn't Mr. seem Sarwar. to want to listen to me, or to the experts, or business leaders across Scotland. So maybe he'll listen to his own side. In just a year of his leadership, three defections, nine SNP MPs abandoning ship, and his own deputy leader saying SNP MPs might not turn up to work. He's been called authoritarian by one of his longest-serving. MSPs, accused of lacking vision by Kate Forbes, called a commentator, not a leader by Alec Neil, and his general election strategy has been trashed by Pete Wishart, his party's longest serving MP. And in one short year, Hamza Youssef has lost every electoral test he has been set. Everyone. So is he worried that the people of Scotland, like many people sitting behind him, believe that Alec Neil is right, that the strategy is mince? First Minister. Presiding officer, again, another display of Anna Sauer's famed arrogance and hubris in this chamber, taking the people of Scotland for granted. And he talks about vision. He talks, presiding officer. First well, Minister. Sorry, well, he's getting colleagues, support from the Conservatives, presiding officer, that tell you everything you need to know. No, first, first Minister, if you, if you might sit. Let's ensure that we can hear one another. Plenty of when it comes uh, to vision, let me remind Anna Sarwar, it was just last week that his colleagues in UK Labour were praising Margaret Thatcher for her vision, <laughs> presiding uh, officer. In the year that I have been First Minister, presiding officer, I can stand here and say that I have stood by my values and my principles. Those values and those principles will see an estimated 100,000 children lifted out of poverty. Those values will see record investment in our NHS, record numbers of junior doctors joining the NHS. They have seen the implementation of a fully funded council tax freeze despite Labour's best efforts to thwart it. Those values have seen private sector employment grow in Scotland higher than any other UK nation. And as I say, the only consistency Anna Sawar has 
is this inconsistency, his you dumping and, and you turning and dumping of policies from the two child limit to, of course, the lifting on the cap of bankers' bonuses, and most shamefully, presiding officer, is the latest betrayal of the waspy woman that Anna Sawar promised to campaign for and he's now turned his back on. Unforgivable. The waspy woman won't forget, nor will they forgive, presiding officer. Question number three, Stephen Kerr. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government plans to take following the publication of the University of Stirling study highlighting the reported risk of crumb rubber infill on artificial pitches. First Minister. Local sport and leisure facilities, including, of course, artificial grass pitches, are vital in supporting the physical <coughs> and mental health of the nation. We will, of course, give full consideration to the new research in this area, and we're supportive of efforts to examine evidence that have been commissioned by DEFRA on the wider impacts of microplastics. This report, expected early next year, will be material in helping shape regulation that we will take forward in this very area. One factor that will also help to shape our future action is the work of the EU to phase out the use of rubber crumb in 2031. Sport Scotland is also working with others to explore alternative artificial pitch systems and more suitable infill products to replace the spread of microplastics in the environment. Stephen Kerr. Well, I thank the First Minister for his reply. And it is important to say that we aren't talking about all artificial playing surfaces. For example, there's an excellent new artificial pitch at Falkirk Stadium installed after the UK government, working with the SFA, provided funding through the Leveling Up Fund. But what we are talking about is one particular type of artificial pitch, the type which uses artificial turf crumb rubber infill from shredded end-of-life vehicle tyres. This is terrible for microplastics and is highlighted in the Stirling University report potentially bad for health. And the obvious question is, do we know exactly how many such pitches there are or indeed where they are? So will the First Minister commit the Scottish Government to coordinate and work with local authorities to determine the state of artificial pitches across Scotland and to publish the results. First Minister. <clears throat> I will consider uh, Stephen Kerr's suggestion uh, seriously. We will uh, look to see whether or not that is a uh, worthwhile uh, endeavour given the recent research that Stephen Kerr uh, indicates. I would go back to the response that I made to Stephen Kerr in his opening question, which is that we are very supportive of the efforts to examine the evidence, and there is that work being undertaken by uh, DEFRA <laughs> on the wider uh, impacts of microplastics. I do understand that Sports Scotland is also working with other at home nation sports associations to explore what the alternative artificial pitch systems are that are more sustainable uh, in, in, in the longer uh, term. So that work uh, is ongoing. I'm happy to write to, to ensure that the appropriate minister writes to Stephen Kerr uh, with the detail of the work that's already being undertaken, uh, even while we're waiting for that research. But we are supportive of the research to understand uh, the impacts of this rubber crumb uh, infill and getting a better understanding uh, of the, the use of rubber uh, crumb infill. Uh, right across uh, Scotland. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First, I declare an interest as convener of the cross-party group on animal welfare to ask the First Minister, further to the regulations relating to XL bully-type dogs coming into force, to whom a dog owner can apply for advice on whether their dog fits the confirmation of the XL bully type, in light of reports, a substantial number of dog owners in England are now applying to deregister their dogs, having established retrospectively that their pet does not conform to the DEFRA definition of an XL bully type dog. First Minister. The Scottish Government's website provides the definition used for an XL bully dog, provides a guide for owners to check if their dog is an XL bully, if they're not sure, and to determine whether, that dog, whether their dog uh, falls within the definition uh, if they need to apply for an exemption certificate by the end of July. The Minister for Community Safety has written to all MSPs to provide further information about the exemption scheme, which opens on Monday the 1st of April uh, all the way till the 31st of July. Christine Graham. I thank the First Minister for his reply. In England and Wales, 55,000 applications have been made for registration. 300 dogs put down, healthy and well-behaved dogs, as a result of knee-jerk UK legislation following horrendous but very few fatal dog attacks, not even wholly attributable to an XL bully type. There is yet no UK guidance on how to deregister. The pet owner decides if their pet conforms to the DEFRA definition 
20 inches in height for a dog, 19 inches for a bitch to be registered, and if it doesn't conform to that, you needn't check the other confirmation characteristics. Can I respectfully suggest that the Scottish Government provide clear guidance to the public at large in a publicity scheme on the definition and on deregistration, given that we are stuck, frankly, with this wholly unnecessary and unjust legislation? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, can I first of all uh, note, uh, of course, uh, Christine Graham's uh, uh, criticisms of uh, the way that the UK Government brought forward uh, this legislation, and then I know she also has concerns uh, about uh, uh, the, the Scottish Government uh, action in this regard, but nonetheless, she has been constructive in her challenge, uh, and I welcome uh, that approach, and I think her ask of order, in order for the Scottish Government to be crystal clear about the guidance, but also seeking to look at some kind of publicity campaign is one that I will absolutely take away uh, and give it weighty uh, consideration. I know the member is absolutely passionate about this issue, and we are seeking to, she, she, she recognised, close uh, a loophole that has been created by the UK Government legislation, uh, and therefore it's important that uh, the definition of an exile bully dog is consistent across uh, the UK. On, on deregistering the exemption process, um, we are again looking to uh, try to have a consistent approach uh, across the UK and we're in discussions with the UK Government uh, on this. But nonetheless, uh, I will take away what Christine Graham has said and suggested in terms of uh, crystal clear guidance and any potential publicity that we can, make, uh, that we can do uh, around that guidance. Providing Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Much of the current confusion could have been avoided if Scotland had kept pace with other parts of the UK on regulations of this nature. Yesterday, in fact, the Yesterday, in fact, the Community Safety Minister reiterated the Scottish Government's position that it is deed, not breed. However, this is breed-specific uh, legislation by its very nature. In a number of weeks, we've seen attacks on people. We've had dogs killed. Their armed police have had to restrain this type uh, of dog. And there have been a series of very serious incidents, sometimes fatal to humans and to other pets. So the problem is clear. What I'd like to know from the First Minister is how can the government maintain its deed not breed position that it currently holds, but more importantly, what will the government do to enforce these new regulations and to ensure that there is clarity to the public? First Minister. Well, I said to Jamie Green, he makes the point that we didn't keep uh, pace with UK legislation. Well, we weren't informed about UK legislation. The first we were ever told about it was via BBC News website on the 15th yeah. of September as it was being reported. It was two weeks later that the Scottish Government actually then received a letter from the UK Government on the 29th of September on the, actual, uh, on the actual issue. But it had no detail, no detail at all, on the specific approach and, crucially, no detail on the potential impact on Scotland. And then on the 14th of November, the Minister for Victims and Community Safety uh, Communities wrote to the UK Government to seek clarity on controls on English and Welsh exile bully dogs in terms of selling or gifting dogs in Scotland. But on the 14th of December, a month later, the relevant UK Government Minister replied, giving no clarity whatsoever on the issue at all. So Scotland does have a, a dog control and notice, as the member knows. It doesn't exist in England uh, and Wales. It's a, it's a, it's a regime uh, and a system that I have a great uh, confidence in. There's more than 1,200 uh, active uh, dog control notices uh, at the moment, and, and XL bully dogs represent 2% of the DCNs that are in force. I stand by the deed not breed. The departure from the deed not breed approach is not one that we have taken lightly at all. We've had to respond to circumstances in other parts of the UK. What would make our life materially much easier and be more consistent in terms of our approach would be if the UK government didn't just announce legislation that could have an impact in Scotland without telling us, but actually engage with us beforehand, presiding officer. Question number five, Paul Sweeney. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to expedite the restoration of the Glasgow School of Art in light of it being nearly a decade since the first fire. First Minister. The Scottish Government does recognise the cultural and historical significance of the Macintosh building. Its world-renowned status, the importance of the Mac to the School of Art, the city of Glasgow and indeed to Scotland as a whole. We have welcomed the Glasgow School of Art's plan for a faithful reinstatement of the Macintosh building. The Macintosh building is, of course, owned by the Glasgow School of Art, who have responsibility for their own strategic and operational decision-making. The Glasgow School of Art's ambition to rebuild the Mac and eventually reopen it as a graduate school for the benefit of staff, for the benefit of students, and indeed for the benefit of the local community uh, and the city is, I'm sure, something that will be welcomed uh, right across this chamber. Paul Sweeney. The Glasgow School of Art's Macintosh building is indeed one of the world's most revered Art Nouveau buildings. It is an intrinsic part 
of Glasgow's identity. Yet the shell of the building has now been left languishing for 10 years after the devastating second fire of June 2018, as chronicled by the Herald newspaper this week. Like the French president did with Notre Dame, will the First Minister now personally intervene to expedite restoration of the Glasgow School of Art by following international best practice and establish a new statutory delivery authority with specific responsibility for developing and delivering the restoration project in concert with the Glasgow School of Art by 2030? First Minister. Mr. President, officer, um, can I say that I do recognise the good work that Paul Sweeney uh, does as a trustee of Glasgow uh, City Heritage uh, Trust. And I know he has a genuine interest in seeing the building, as we all do, uh, restored uh, for the benefit of uh, the city and the country uh, as a whole. I would say there are obviously differences between uh, the MAC building uh, and indeed the Notre Dame Cathedral. The Notre Dame Cathedral is owned by the French government. Yeah. Uh, of course, the MAC is owned by the Glasgow uh, School of Art. And what I would say uh, is that some of the delays, and it's absolutely right for Paul Sweeney to question uh, and other members to question the length of time uh, that restoration is taking. It would be fair to say, as part of the context, that for a number of years, of course, the building was under the control uh, of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service as they were continuing to conduct uh, their investigation uh, into their fire because of the complexities that took a number of uh, years. So the Glasgow School of Art continues to have responsibility for the MAC. I don't think uh, the Scottish Government uh, commandeering that building is the right uh, commandeering that building is the right approach. Um, what the Glasgow School of Art have explained in the outline business case is that they um, expect funding for the Macintosh building to come from a whole range of sources, um, from obviously fire insurance proceeds donations and pledges, capital receipts and reserves. They haven't made a request to the government at this stage, but of course we will look to seek to, 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 to ensure that we can support the Glasgow School of Art in the restoration of the MAC because it is of critical importance. So I will, after uh, First Minister's questions, uh, ensure uh, that we do continue to reach out to Glasgow School of Art to see what further support we can provide. Question number six, Maggie Chapman. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on what action the Scottish Government is taking to deliver the New Deal for tenants. First Minister. I am uh, delighted that on Tuesday this week the Housing Scotland Bill was introduced to this Parliament, making, uh, marking a huge milestone in our commitment to help deliver that new deal uh, for tenants that we're extremely uh, proud of. This bill creates new tenants' rights, it introduces powers for longer term private sector rent controls, it will also introduce new duties aimed at the prevention of homelessness. A fairer, well regulated private rented sector is in the interest, of course, of both tenants and indeed of responsible landlords. Our proposals will help to improve affordability for tenants in the private rented sector while recognising the importance of landlords investing in property quality. Maggie Chapman. Thank the First Minister for his answer. The Housing Bill's publication is an important step in delivering the New Deal for tenants. It includes key policies that Scottish Greens consider vital. Protections against evictions, a framework for long-term rent controls, new rights for tenants to have pets and decorate their homes. I know many want it to go further, but vested interests say it is already too radical. Can the First Minister say how the Scottish Government has sought to make these proposals robust against legal challenge, and can he commit to ensuring that the voices of tenants are heard as loudly as those of property investors? First Minister. Uh, can I say, uh, President Officer, that I am very proud of the Housing Bill and, and the uh, additional protections that we are bringing forward uh, for uh, tenants. Let me also though recognise, I think this is an important point to make, uh, that the vast majority of landlords are responsible uh, landlords uh, and they, they will undoubtedly uh, have a good relationship uh, with their uh, tenants. And I'm really grateful for everybody's engagement, tenants, landlords, the private rental sector, investors and others, for their engagement over the last two years since we first consulted on the New Deal uh, for tenants. We will, of course, continue to listen to the voices of tenants, as we have done throughout. Uh, tenants who have clear rights, which they know how to exercise, they feel empowered to use. It's not just good for tenants, but as I've mentioned already, it's good for landlords and I would suggest good for let letting agents too. Uh, I recognise there are strong feelings around some of the measures being proposed in the bill. However, the government believes the rented sector, uh, the rented sector reform measures continue to safeguard the reasonable and proportionate use of landlords' property for rental purposes, seeking to deliver a fair balance between the protection for tenants, which I think we all accept, agree uh, and support, and also the rights of landlords as well. I hope we can all agree 
a fairer, well-regulated rented sector uh, is good for both tenants and responsible landlords. Brief supplementary, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday, the National Tenants Union Living Rent described the proposed housing bill as a huge step forward for tenants. Can the First Minister outline how this new legislation will help to prevent homelessness and build on Scotland's already strong housing legislation? First Minister. Scotland does, of course, already have the strongest rights in the UK for people who are homeless, but we know we can do more and we want to build on this record, hence uh, the legislation that has been introduced. The bill brings a renewed focus on prevention so that households do not have to go through the trauma, the disruption of homelessness in the first place. Relevant bodies such as health boards will be required to ask and act about a person's housing situation. And local authorities will be required to act earlier to prevent homelessness. Uh, Matt Downey, Chief Executive of Crisis, has, and I quote, strongly welcomed the bill, saying the plans hold the potential to create a truly world-leading homelessness system. Our job, of course, is to make sure that potential uh, translates into reality. And we are committed to working closely with stakeholders in ensuring the guidance and training to support the new prevention duties will be fit for purpose. We move to constituency and general supplementaries. Let's keep them concise and the responses too. And I call Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, two years ago in the Coming Home report, uh, ministers pledged that by March 2024, we would see real change with out-of-area residential placements and inappropriate hospital stays for young people end, and that we would actually see uh, a proper care package put in place for families and families and individuals having that choice taken into account. Now, the government have failed to deliver that. So can I ask the minister, when will he update Parliament on this promise made to some of the most vulnerable people and their families in our country. First Minister. Can I first, first of all recognise that Miles Briggs uh, has a long-standing interest in this issue. He's raised it many times. I remember him raising it uh, to me in previous uh, ministerial uh, guises. And what I would say to, to uh, Miles Briggs is we do take the issue uh, incredibly uh, seriously. I will uh, look at the latest progress in relation uh, to the update that we have promised. Uh, but we want to make sure we are doing right in terms of the proper care packages uh, that uh, those uh, who are most vulnerable, as Miles Briggs rightly describes them, uh, are given the appropriate care. So I will ensure that he is given a written update uh, after FMQs. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. This week, South Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnership voted to close two care homes, including McClimate House in Lanark, to help plug a £33 million funding shortfall. The closures will save just £600,000 next year, but are devastating for residents, older, vulnerable people who now face being kicked out of their homes. The partnership, including councillors in his own party, have written to the Scottish Government with a last-minute appeal to provide additional support to save those care homes. So will the First Minister do the right thing? Will he listen to families whose loved ones will soon lose their homes? Will he intervene and save McClimate House and Dewar House care homes? First Minister. Representing officer, in terms of uh, the closure of Dewar House and McClimate uh, House in South Lanarkshire, I mean, of course, nobody wants to see the closure of good quality uh, care homes. And I should say the context of this, of course, is that we have increased local government settlement for 24-25. And of course, we have uh, met our ambition to increase social care spend uh, by 25% two years earlier than we said uh, we would uh, as well. Nobody wants to see the closure of good quality care homes, but care homes we know can uh, close for a number uh, of uh, reasons. And that's why we're committed to that national care service which provides that national, consistent, high quality of social care uh, support. Uh, what I would say uh, to, to, to the members, it is disappointing that South Lanarkshire Council, uh, run of course by uh, his party, uh, are choosing to disinvest and we will be seeking assurances that alternative arrangements are put in place to support the people of South Lanarkshire. And I go back to the point of course that we are giving uh, an, an increase, a real terms increase to a local government in budget 24-25% officer. Colette Stevenson. Uh, Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the First Minister may be aware of uh, Glen Almond Group Limited going into administration earlier this month. This led to almost 100 people being made redundant with no notice, including 94 people at Valve Components Limited in East Kilbride. Can the First Minister outline what support has been or can be provided to the workers there and can he also talk about his vision for the future of manufacturing in Scotland, a proud part of our history but a sector with a key role to play in our future. 
First Minister. President, I am very concerned to hear about Valve Components Limited, part of the Glen Almond Group, that it has entered administration for 95 immediate job losses. My immediate thoughts, of course, are with the affected employees and their families at such a difficult time. Scottish Enterprise has been liaising with the administrators and has alerted them to a number of businesses in the, in the East Corbide area, which have at this time expressed an interest in recruiting some of the impacted staff. In addition uh, to PACE information being provided to employees, a PACE event was also held last week with a view to minimising the time individuals affected by redundancy are out of work. In terms of the, the broader vision, of course, I'm happy uh, for the appropriate Cabinet Secretary to write to Colette Stevenson with details, but we are investing in the manufacturing sector's future, notably £75 million, in the flagship building of the National Manufacturing Institute in Scotland, which I was proud to open last June. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I write Book Festival, which has been running in Glasgow for nearly 20 years, has been cancelled this year, just weeks before it was due to return after its funding bid was rejected by Creative Scotland. And this comes just weeks after it was revealed that the Quango initially awarded an explicit film £85,000. Can the First Minister clarify Creative Scotland's prioritisation process right. in cultural funding decisions and what steps the Scottish Government are taking to safeguard the diversity and vibrancy of Glasgow's cultural landscape? First Minister. So I write is a fantastic uh, festival. Anybody that has had the pleasure of being able to uh, attend its events in the past uh, knows the value that it brings, not just to the city, uh, but indeed I would suggest to the country uh, as a whole. Uh, of course, Annie Wells will be aware that these decisions are for Creative Scotland uh, to make, and they make them independently of Scottish Government uh, ministers. Nonetheless, of course, having been uh, alerted to the news, I will look at what uh, potential support Scottish Government uh, can provide, because uh, Annie Wells is right, I write is a fantastic festival, and I would say it's something of a cultural uh, icon, an institution uh, within uh, our uh, festival and cultural landscape. So I will examine the issue and, of course, be happy to keep the member updated. Alistair Allen. How does the First Minister respond to reports today that Brexit has cost Scotland up to £100 million a year in salmon exports? Companies have faced increased costs due to the hard Brexit the Tories forced on Scotland, and Labour too has now reportedly rode back on its pledge to renegotiate the UK's Brexit deal. Does the First Minister agree that in continuing to endorse Brexit, both the Tories and Labour are showing little regard for this vital industry? First Minister. I can agree uh, more, Standing Officer. There is no doubt, and almost all of the independent research, of course, shows that Brexit has been an absolutely unmitigated disaster for our economy. Complete and utter disaster. OBR's own forecast suggests that the UK economy is for, has reduced by, or will reduce by 4% because of the impacts. Uh, of Brexit. And I expect the Conservatives, who are hard Brexiteers, to continue down that uh, disastrous path. I cannot understand why Labour are falling in behind the Conservatives and supporting a hard uh, Brexit. Scotland's food and drink sector has borne the brunt of Brexit, which has disrupted supply chains, created new barriers to trade, and driven up food prices. And Anna Sawar and Jackie Bailey are laughing at the damage that is done at the food and drink sector, presiding officer. It's no laughing matter because it's crystal clear there's a Westminster consensus in favour of Brexit, no matter what the cost to Scotland. And the only way, the only way to stop that damage and rejoin the European Union is for Scotland to become an independent nation. Neil Bibby. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Good journalism is absolutely crucial to a healthy democracy. No one here would claim to relish being confronted with a microphone by the likes of Bernard Ponsonby. Over the last 34 years, he has shortened the career of many politicians. But we all recognise the crucial job he has done and his excellent colleagues across our media continue to do. However, normal service will be disrupted today as National Union of Journalist members at STV take strike action for the first time in over 20 years. Counter to perceptions, I understand half of the newsroom are paid less than a teacher's starting salary, and despite SDV posting £20 million of profits, they are the only broadcaster not to be passing on a percentage pay increase that meets inflation to all of their workers. So in the context of its fair work responsibilities, can I ask the First Minister what representations the Government has made to SDV on this matter? and to encourage meaningful negotiations, a fair deal for the journalists, and an end to this dispute. First Minister. So, you know, so let, me, uh, let me start where Neil Bibby uh, rightly started. Let me uh, praise and pay tribute 
to Bernard uh, Ponsonby, uh, his long uh, standing career in journalism over, of over 30 years. Uh, I wish him well uh, in his uh, retirement, and also I'm grateful that I don't have to be on the other end of a tough interview uh, from him, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, well, uh, of course, it's not for the Scottish Government to directly intervene in this dispute. I would absolutely urge, as Neil Bibby has asked me to do, STV, to get round the table with the employees and their union to try to ensure a satisfactory outcome it can uh, be reached. I was speaking to some STV journalists again on the other end uh, of an interview just yesterday, and I was being told uh, that uh, the, one of the areas and reasons for concerns uh, is the disparity between how ITV is treating its employees versus STV and their employees. So it's our long, long-standing position that a progressive approach to industrial relations, along with stronger protections for workers and fair pay, is at the very heart of a more successful uh, society. So we'll continue to support uh, trade unions uh, right across uh, a variety of sectors and we would encourage STV in this instance to immediately get right back around the table uh, in order to get a fair pay uh, settlement uh, for STV employees uh, and of course uh, crucially uh, journalists uh, too. And Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. News yesterday that Visit Scotland planned to close their eye centre network across the country by 2026 and pursue a digital first strategy has come as a shock in the Northern Isles, which rely on tourism. Does the First Minister share the view of some in the tourism sector that this is a retrograde step? And is he able to indicate if any impact assessment has been conducted on island communities affected by Visit Scotland's decision? First Minister. Uh, officer, of course, it is really important for Visit Scotland to continue its engagement with the tourism sector. They have done that, of course, uh, in relation uh, to this decision. Visit Scotland's own research shows that 99% of visitors now book accommodation in advance of travelling, and 67% of global travellers book their whole itineraries in advance of arriving at their destination using online tools, social media, uh, or indeed travel uh, intermediaries. A number of uh, visitors using eye centres uh, have significantly dropped over several years, but particularly after uh, COVID. And, and the decrease from 2019 to 2023 ranges from 16% to 57% uh, across 25 uh, locations. Notwithstanding that, the points that Beatrice uh, Wishart makes are important, and I would expect Visit Scotland to continue to engage uh, in what is a, an important sector for Scotland, the tourism industry, uh, which is worth so much to us, but also, of course, opens Scotland up to the rest of the world. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions.